Welcome to the Insomnia Project. Sit back, relax, and listen as we have a conversation about the mundane, or hopefully about the mundane, so that you can feel free to just drift off. I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing our podcast with your friends and family. We hope you will listen and sleep. I am your host, Marco Timpano, and joining me in the studio is a dear friend, Keith Barker. Welcome to the Insomnia Project. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. And I should say that no relation to my wife, Amanda Barker, that mm-hmm. we know of, yeah. who you share the same last name. Yes. We've had that that conversation before where we laugh and everyone's like, do you know Amanda Barker? I was like, I do. Yeah. We're not related. So, Do you get Baker a lot? She gets Baker all the time. It's like I hear her say Amanda Barker and then she'll call it, they'll be called and it'll be like Amanda Barker. Um, she'll say Amanda Barker, and they'll call her Amanda Baker right this way. Yeah. She's like, it's Barker. Yeah. But they just hear or they they see it on the page, and they just go with Baker. Yeah, I've been in public where people are like, and Keith Baker, and it's like Barker. And it's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was like, it's okay. It happens, it happens. all yeah. the time. I don't know. That, that R is a tricky, tricky letter. What's your Starbucks name? Do you ever – do you get Keith or do you get different – yeah. I get Markle, like Sparkle <laughs> with an M. So I just want to know what your Starbucks name is. It's Pete. Oh, P- Pete. P-E-T-E. Like Keith, um, I find like uh, if it's like a Ukrainian, they'll go Keith okay. with a T or Keith with an F mm-hmm. if I say my name. But whenever I'm at Starbucks, they're like, Pete, Pete. And I'm like, do you mean Keith? Is that mine? She's mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's Pete. You'd be a great Pete. <laughs> My mom wanted to name me Brad. Oh, really? Yeah. My mom wanted to name me Lance. <laughs> so there you go. Lance Timpano at your service. And then sometimes she says Lloyd. Lloyd was in there too. Oh, my mom, she named me Keith. She said she'd never met a Keith she didn't like. Oh. Yeah. When it was like in the 70s and she had met a couple and then she just thought they were great. And it was just like out of left field. She'd never... Yeah, everyone was like, Keith, where'd that come from? She also named my sister Bryce. Oh, that's kind of yeah. neat. I like and, that. And everyone thinks she's a man. So there's that. Oh, is Bryce a... Uh, it's a man's a name. Ma- male. Tends oh, to be a okay. man's name. But my sister is like, is uh, Mr. Bryce Barker there? It's like, oh. uh, he, it's me? It's like, oh. so. But yeah, my mom, Keith, she was like, I just have always, every Keith I've ever met, I really liked. So. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I feel like that with the name Nick. Every Nick I've ever met, hmm. I'm like, you're, you're a good egg. Yeah, that's true, actually. Every Nick yeah. every Nick I know is actually a really nice there guy. There we go. Yeah. For all our n- listeners there with the first name Nick, this show is dedicated to you today. Yeah, we're sending you love. Yeah. Um, Keith, I want to talk to you about this wonderful organization that you're the artistic director of. You're an actor, you're a writer, you're a playwright, a director. Like many people who've been on my podcast, in my circle of artistic friends, you're one of these wonderful, multi-talented individuals. Oh, that's kind. Thank you. And you're part of a, an organization called Native Earth. Mm. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Um, so Native Earth Performing Arts is Canada's oldest professional indigenous theater company in Canada. Oh, I didn't realize it was the oldest. Yeah, so it's the oldest. And, and you can go to nativeearth.ca. We'll mention that again. But. Yeah. And so um, started. it started in Toronto at, at the Native Canadian Centre. It's Spadina and uh, Bloor is like where the first production happened. And it was two fledgling theatre companies that banded together to make Native Earth. And the very first show they put on was The Red Sisters which, okay. by Thompson Highway, yes. which has become the, the iconic Indigenous play um, that most people have seen at their regional theatre or, mm-hmm. or uh, elsewhere. And it, they they couldn't get any audience in, and they were handing out free tickets on the street. And then their first, I think the Toronto Star gave them a, a rave review, and they sold out, and it went everywhere. It went to Edinburgh. Oh, it, wow. it, it sold out and everywhere, and then the rest is history. Thompson's had a long and storied career after that. But he was artistic director at Native Earth at one time. Oh, that's fantastic. And uh, we've been around for 37 years. That's wonderful. Yeah. So lots of ups and downs, but it's 
it is the when they look at the body of work of indigenous playwrights across mm. Canada, most of those plays have either the artists have either been part of Native Earth at one point, or the work has either come through the 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 we have a festival called Wasagachuk. It's either come through the festival, it's been produced or been supported in some way by Native Earth. And where is that festival, and how can one attend it? It's called Wasa Wasagachuk. Yeah, it's called right? the Wasa Wasagachuk Begins to Dance Festival. Currently, okay. it runs in November, so okay. we run it in the third week of November, like. This year, I think it's the thirteenth to the twenty fifth. Oh, fantastic! And uh, it's a, it's a, it's a festival of new new work and development. It's multidisciplinary, so it can be opera, dance, theater, spoken word, music, things like that. And um, and that's been around for thirty two years. And yeah, it's over the, all those many nights we we do excerpts of different pieces. So artists, it's like blood on the floor. It's like dramaturgs and anyone who doesn't know what a dramaturg is like an editor they get in a room with the playwright and with actors and they read they have three to five um, workshops and they work on the play and then they present what they've been working on to kind of like it helps develop the play further right and so you get this like sometimes actors have received their scripts the day of and they get up in front of an audience and they read them so they're live readings and, and if it's a dance they've been working all in a studio for a couple of days and then they come and kind of show where the work and development's at. So it's, it's got this vibe. It's got this excitement that it's like bringing something to life, bringing the words or the, bringing the movements off the page mm -hmm. to life. Yeah. And then it's, it's, I love seeing that because you see what the work, like you just, just see a fire in the work mm -hmm. that um, gets smoothed out and, and, you know, worked in its final product. But when you get to see that, it's so, there's so much energy and there's so much passion and there's so much liveliness and your, my eyes anyways, widen mm -hmm. when I watch, when I watch works like that. Yeah. And I, th I find that actors actually make bolder choices when they have a script in front of them. Right. And they've had some time to work with it. There's some familiarity. And so they get in front of an audience and I find that they can make choices in the scripts that maybe if they're worried about memorizing or worried about their blocking when it's like a play or a professional production, mm -hmm. that's something different. Whereas when they have the freedom of just the page in front of them, mm -hmm. that play comes and it l allows me and my imagination to go. And some of the best plays I've ever heard have been in these situations where I just get to watch an actor just kind of make bold choices in front of an audience. So it's pretty great. So you work with a lot of Canadian or North American indigenous playwrights and, and actors and writers and dancers and artists. Yes. Have you seen works of indigenous people in other countries as well? Is there a commonality in the work of our North American indigenous community and artists to those of other nations. Yeah, so we've started to connect globally. So there's a global First Nations exchange that I was part of, first happened in Brisbane at, uh, two years ago at mm -hmm. the Australia Performers Arts Market. And, and basically it was the first time space had been given for artists from around the world, indigenous artists to come together. And the conversations immediately finding connections, finding things and commonalities and, and, and the work that everybody wants to do and everybody, everyone feeling like this indigenous voice is rising, like after many years of colonization, right. many years of, um, uh, arts funders not supporting the, these works because, you know, there's this, it's, it's hard because arts funders see culture and art as different, or they used to. Oh. So if it was cultural practice, like powwow. Sure. Is a cultural practice, right. they would say. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't fund that because it's cultural. That's your cultural oh. practice. But in a lot of indigenous communities, culture and art are the same. Of course. They are in the same breath. How do you separate a breath? You can't. Like right. it's, so, you know, it, that kind of shit, that, and that's the difference between a colonial idea of what art is right. and what an indigenous worldview and of art is. It's like, you can't separate these two things. Right. It's like ownership. When, you know, we started talking about these works that, because a lot of it was talking about with other, other our indigenous artists around the world is like, what ownership is? Who owns these songs? Who, right. you know, we talking about like how art has been t taken away and then used and then in, incorporated in operas and all this stuff sure. like and then just it, talking uh, starting a conversation around what that is because for m for many 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 years and many of the indigenous artists in the worldview is the sense that there is no ownership it's like how do you own the sky right 
Like, how do you own this land? Like, when you're gone, it's not yours anymore. Right. So how do you own that? Mm -hmm. So that, you know, that idea of ownership has always been, is always clashed against this colonial idea of, like, setting up stakes and this is mine and this song I own so I get all the rights to that. And it was like, whereas community, it was around community and around, like, the better good of everybody. Sure. You know, like, it wasn't about, like, I get all the money and you have none. It would You would always share. And like the, And that was... That was that world of survival, right? Like that's how you survived as community. So in the same as art, everything was shared, right. you know, storytellers, everything's oral. So someone would always tell you their story, or always share stories with each other with the idea of sharing it, not the idea that you have now own it and you're going to go make money off right. of it. And so when we start talking globally, like I'm, we, we have a really strong relationship right now with the Australian indigenous um, uh, and, and the Maori. In right. New Zealand. So we've all been talking. We went to this Global First Nations exchange and just started talking about the work they're doing. Because they had like – you talk about residential schools. Right. They had their former residential schools wow. as well. And, you know, and, and just in the, the children being taken away and they're being like – you know, suppressing the idea of, of being indigenous sure. and like assimilating everybody. So right. that whole thing had happened. In New Zealand, they had the same thing, but be, they've – They've retained language and that like they do the haka, like lots of schools do the haka in the morning. There's lots of language still. It gets a little complicated in Canada because there are so many different nations. Sure. Whereas Maori, you know, there are different regions. They speak different, like, but Canada, there's just. Well, the geography alone, right? It makes it really complicated. And and there's so many, like so many different regions Mm. and so many different communities within communities within communities. And so, um, and, and each province has dealt with with their indigenous populations differently and continue to. So it, it always bothered me as a child. I remember this memory being very young that I was learning French in school, but I wasn't learning an indigenous language. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying, why aren't we learning an indigenous language as one of our languages? And I understand the complexities because there's many different indigenous languages, but I never understood why I wasn't learning one of the indigenous indigenous languages in school, like a French class, in the area that I happened to be growing up in. Mm-hmm. And it always bothered me. Mm-hmm. It always bothered me. And then I studied linguistics later on. And I always had a love for when when our professor of phonetics was um, talking about indigenous languages in North America and certain sounds that are made. Um, and we were looking at places in, in the mouth that different languages you would use that, let's say, English speakers don't use as much, whether mm-hmm. it's more nasal for certain European languages or back of the throat for certain uh, languages that use more guttural uh, sounds. So I always found, found that fascinating. I always thought it was sad that I didn't that we didn't learn an indigenous language in school. Yeah. And I think we should. Well, in Northern Ontario, where I was, grew up, I remember asking, because I didn't like French. I right. really didn't like French. But I think it's more because it was a ter- like the curriculum, the way they sure. taught French. I just felt, you know, the Francophones know how to do it, how to teach English. Yes. And you can see that. You see the results. Mm-hmm. But you really see the results of Ontario's, like, French language program because mm-hmm. hardly anyone speaks it. And I remember asking because they had Ojibwe in our high school. Oh, they did. And okay. I asked if I could take that class instead of French. And they told me no. Wow. They told that they actually told me that class wasn't for me. Wow! And and I think it's because you know, as as someone who's Métis, right. as a mixed heritage person, you see me and you don't think you know, right. you don't know until you speak to someone, and so that's always that's always a barrier. And so I think the teacher was actually just like, oh, that 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 isn't for you. That's right. actually for Indigenous people. Right. And I was like, oh, can you help? explain what Métis is for our international listeners who may have never encountered, or even for North American listeners who might be like, I've heard the word, but I don't know what that yeah. word signifies. Why? Well, it's a comp. Métis it's is a very yeah, complicated. It's not a, sorry, I know no. I'm putting this on you. And no, it's no, like, it's good. Okay. It's good. I, I mean, as a Métis person, okay. I always have to think about how, how we answer that because, um, you know, it's started to be adopted as just as a mix. Right. Like I'm Métis because I'm mix. I'm I'm half Cree. I'm half Ukrainian, or I'm half you know Filipino. I'm 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 half Ojibwe. Like so, I'm just Métis. Okay. And in actual fact, Métis people come from a certain area in Saskatchewan. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. And my impression of Métis was uh, French blood, Indigenous blood. Yeah. That's what I thought it was. So I'm glad to know a clearer. Well, and there's also Scottish in that. 
Okay. So that so that that Métis that that area in Saskatchewan, uh, it, there is actually certain area that Métis people, and and that's what people say. Like this, this they come from certain areas, but then then, then where I'm from up um, because they were people transient. There was also in Northern Ontario up near Sudbury, Mattawa in that area. There's a Métis population there too, wow. and so there are. Discussions about what is Métis, who has the right to say who they are Métis, um, because those those cultures have existed, and actually in Northern Ontario, they actually can date back that that Métis. They've actually like legitimized the Métis culture in that sp- in that place from way way back. So they've had to actually like get recognition so that they can call themselves Métis, and then 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 you know the famous place out in Saskatchewan. So. So yeah, so it's a complicated thing about what Métis, and I still see people are adopting this sure. idea of that they're Métis because they're half French or half Scottish, half half whatever they're right. in mixes. So that's fascinating. Okay, as a white European Canadian male, mm-hmm. if you could help me with this, and I apologize if I sound if my ignorance is showing, but I genuinely want to know, Indigenous, Native, mm-hmm. what should I be using? And how should I be using it so that I'm using the terms appropriately that the indigenous community of my country or or North America expect I should be using? Mm. That's a really great question, and it's a question I get asked a lot. Yeah, um, there was a. Time. And I know you're not the definitive no nope. person, but I just know that you you are know much more than I do, and I appreciate any insight that you can give me so that I can make an informed uh, and I, decision. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that, and and to say that this is my opinion, but also you know, this is my experience. Great. Is that there was a time when people, you know, native, you know, was was acceptable, and sure. then it moved to there was a time it became Aboriginal. Right, Aboriginal was accepted. And then people moved into this idea that indigenous, it's a little more global. It kind of encompasses indigenous as a, as a, as a, almost a worldview of, of indigenous people. And then sometimes people are, there's a whole group, a whole, all kinds of people that don't like that word. They don't like to be referred to someone. I've been in a room with an elder and someone said, you know, you know, as indigenous people, and he's like, I'm not indigenous. I'm Cree. Okay. And so some t- I have found that I just I need to ask even in all the circles that I mm-hmm. is is to continually ask how people like to be referred or how they want to be referred. Okay. Um because I you know everybody has a different relationship to those words and because sure. because it's ever changing too. Like it just continues to evolve and right. so I think it's always good just to ask what if, if it's okay like right now I I find that most people are using indigenous. Okay. Um and but, that could change. And, and, that, and you might be listening to this yeah. podcast in five years' time, yeah. and that may have changed. Yeah. But you're right. It doesn't – it never hurts to ask. Yeah. And, and actually, I know that lots of people really appreciate when someone's like, how, how should I refer? Do you, do you want – like, how would you like to be referred right. as? Or like when I'm talking about – and someone – it's just like, oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Mm-hmm. I'd like to be called Indigenous or, okay. hey, no, I, I'm Métis. Or so. First Nation. Yeah. So First Nations uh, or Inuit or, right. you know, and and those distinctions are important for people. And some, for some other people there, you meet some people like, I don't care. Right. And you're like, oh, great. Huh. Then it doesn't it doesn't necessarily matter. And then for other people, it's like I, it actually means a great deal to me to be this. And, sure. and so it's like it and, and, and it's interesting because in the work I do, I'm always in a room full of people from all different backgrounds, right. all different, all different nations, all different identifying. Mm-hmm. Like it's, and so it's always, we try our best to be as generous as possible just with how people want to be acknowledged. Sure. So, of course. Yeah. That's pretty key. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to ask, mm-hmm. and if I'm in a conversation with another person who is of my background or is Canadian and doesn't identify or doesn't have any roots to indigenous um, culture, uh, bloodline, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Once again, I feel like I'm, I'm stomping on terms that are no, ill-conceived, okay. but I think I'll use indigenous until I'm told otherwise or until someone yeah. joins a conversation where I can ask. Yeah. Yeah. And there you go. Well, thank you for clarifying that. Um, I want to mention www.nativeearth.ca check it out. Our conversation's not done, oh. but I wanted to uh, shift a little bit. You're a playwright. Yep. What is the part of playwriting that you enjoy most? Oh, um, 
definitely not the writing. Okay. Yeah. I think it's the editing. The editing. Yeah. Okay. I think that once you have it on the page and then you can, I feel like that's when the work begins because then you can start working what you're, mm -hmm. what you have, the story, start working the arc, make sure that you're, you're telling the story you mm -hmm. want to tell. I'm always fascinated when I, I mean, it's the most painful thing to have people read it. Sure. I sweat through my shirt. Okay. Like it's a painful process, but I learned so much through it and to hear what they reflect back to me is always like, I have to go away and think about it. But that editing aspect like that, like the, the first draft is always the hardest. Okay. And, uh, and once you've, once you've done your first draft, then, then you start refining it. And that's always to me an exciting, you feel like you're moving it then beyond a first draft. What do you love about playwriters that you esteem? Um, language. Okay. I, I, I love how people, I love how there are just certain playwrights that I can read and I know it's their work. Okay. I just love smart. For example, Michael Healy. Mm hmm. Yeah. Thompson Highway. Sure. Yvette Nolan. Like, I, you know, there's just some, yeah, it's the, 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 the Tara Began uh, wrote this play called Honor Beat, and um, it was happening uh, as her father was passing away. Like she was, and it was, a, and it's about a, a woman that is saying goodbye to her children. She's in a hospital bed. Oh wow! And just the language that is in that that is just it's like it's it's about a sister's relationship with their mother. Sounds like a powerful piece. It's a really powerful piece. It's going to be at the Grand in London this year. That's London, so, Ontario. Yeah, and that's 2019-20 season. But if London, England wants to bring it over. They would. They would. They yeah. should. Yeah. But it's a, the, to me, it's the language like you recognize. I always love when a playwright is able to hit language that we all recognize. Is like, oh, that that's an argument I have with my mom or Oh, that that's totally my dad or something like sure. to me is like there's something that we can that we ring inside of us that a playwright is able to capture. That is, there's something we relate to immediately and we get on we get on with. So it's that's my most exciting. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, also, I want to talk about ice hockey. I know it's one of the stereotypes, all Canadians mm -hmm. and ice hockey, <laughs> but I have someone who is a ice hockey star. Star? Uh, yeah, I uh, want to say star because I'm so bad at it that right. anyone's a star compared to me. Right. Uh, tell me about your love for ice hockey. And you play, right? I play. So okay. I play in an arts league here in Toronto. Okay. That so is that, would, you, would that be considered a rough and tumble league? No, no. Right. It's, it, it, as they call it, a, I would say a gentle person's league, but okay. it, they used to call it a gentleman's league. Okay. And that idea that um, that they're all artists, all working, that everyone has to – they, they didn't want it to be a beer league. And so the whole idea was we want to be better. Okay. And so you get points in the standings for no penalties. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So if you get a penalty, you lose a point. Like you, you don't get the point I or see. whatever. And so you're encouraged not to have penalties. And you're encouraged to like if someone falls down to make sure they're okay and stuff like that. And oh, so, that's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, it can get a little chippy. Sure. Yeah. But that's hockey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's one of the best experiences in hockey I've ever had. I mean, I grew up in a small town where at a certain age, if you weren't a certain size or you weren't of a certain skill, then you just weren't going to play hockey anymore. Oh, wow. And so I didn't – I played – I mostly played shinny. And So we should mention what shinny is because we have oh, people right. who are listening in Saudi Arabia right, right. now who are like, I don't know what, what that is means. Shinny? So shinny is just like outdoor – going to an outdoor rink and just – skating with people who show up and, and just, just no equipment, just skate with a hockey stick and your toque would toque his hat in cold weather and mm -hmm. skates and you just skate around and play. It's casual hockey. So you're not wearing any of the equipment. And so I didn't play for many years. And then, you know, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine said, Hey, I, you love hockey. I was like, Oh my God, I love hockey. I right. love, I watch it. I love, sure. you know, and he was like, would you like to play on a team? I was like, I'm not good enough to play on a team. He's like, Hey, I'm playing on a group of like, there's guys who can barely skate and there's guys who can really skate. Like it's everybody. Yeah. So I went out there and some, literally some guys could barely skate and, and some guys could. And so the, it was such a mixed level of skating. Sure. And it was just all these guys in their thirties and forties living their dream. Wow. Just playing hockey together. Sure. And it was like, we enjoyed more about sitting in the room with each other talking and then playing. And then the arts league came along and I was like, I played in a tournament 
they have a tournament every spring. I love this. They call it Hockey Christmas. and happens in, on Easter weekend every year. <laughs> it people just come, gets better. I know. It comes from, people come from across the country. Okay. It's been going on for over 20 years. It's like – and it's mostly musicians. So that whole weekend, they rent out the Horseshoe Tavern, which is one of the most infamous, like, music venues in Toronto. On Queen Street, Queen and Spadina, if I'm yep. not mistaken. The, the Rolling Stones played there. Every musician from the yep. person who could barely play an instrument to the – most seasoned musician has come through and come played through there. and yep. played there. It's like, a, and what they do is they rent the whole weekend, and then the everyone has to have an artistic contribution. Sure. And these hockey teams uh, have a band, like they they get up and they play music. Wow. And so one after the other, and they have to have a theme, and they can't wear costumes, and like it's like this whole weekend of. So you play hockey all Friday. Friday night you go to the bar and you watch all these people perform they oftentimes mix like it's like star wars david bowie or you know like acdc black sabbath and sure. like they meld these like they're they're oftentimes really good musicians and then there's those who aren't but they kind of come together and they do whatever the thing there's so it's always an interesting night but this i played in this tournament loved it so much that i started my own team oh that's amazing so you have to play this first season you play seven games you have to prove to them that you're like committed committed but you're also like that you're going to play the way they want you to play. Right. So they test you. So that you're they, not some thug who just wants to muscle their way exactly. uh, m- amongst the players. Yeah. They want they want people who are going to respect the league and that. Right. So we played seven games and they try to get you penalties. They play you hard to see if you're going to react, if there's going to be fights. Nobody. Everyone's like, keep it calm. Great. And then we got invited into the league and we called our team the Friendly Giants. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So we actually have it's a, it for anyone who doesn't know the Friendly Giant. The Friendly Giant was a TV show on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation the CBC. In, in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. And it was a children's show and it was this giant and he had two puppets. He had Jerome, who was the giraffe, and Rusty, who that's was right. the rooster. Who, the rooster. And, you know, and so we have them on our. Oh, that's so on great. Our, so oh. he's, he's there. He's got a missing tooth and a hockey stick. And then we have the two puppets. So they're called, we're called the Friendly Giants. That's amazing. Yeah. I'm we, only taking umbrage with one thing that you've said through this whole podcast. And I think it's the only place where I can truly speak. A toque is not a hat. A toque is a toque. And if you don't know what a toque <laughs> is, it's like a knitted, Americans will call it beanie, uh, a knitted article of clothing that keeps you warm on your head that has a fold up. <laughs> a toque is a toque is a toque. And it cannot be called anything but because only when you wear a toque do you understand the wonderfulness <laughs> of a toque. That is very true. There you go. I had a moment of like a toque. Oh, people who don't know yeah, it. Of course. They, it's a hat. It's not a hat. I always try to define anything that's very Canadian yeah. or very North American for all our listeners, <laughs> whether they appreciate it or not. They might be rolling their eyes right now. Yeah. Um, but uh, Keith Barker, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this episode I've had such a fun time. So have I. Thanks and so much. And during the episode, a washing washing machine repair person has come over, <laughs> and I've had to stop it so that I can have a conversation with him. And, and right now, the gentleman is hopefully fixing my washing machine. Native Earth, before we leave, is there anything you'd like to mention to our listeners about Native Earth? They can go to the website, which is nativeearth.ca. Uh, well, this year we're doing my play. So, you know, I was a... What uh, is the name of your play? Is, my play is called This Is How We Got Here. Um, it was a finalist for the Governor General this Fantastic. past year, um, and it's it's going to be in January. Great. So we Where? start rehearsals. It'll be at so Native Earth has its own theater. It's called the Aki Studio, mm-hmm. and it's in the Daniel Spectrum Building. Oh, wonderful! Yeah, so it's in Regent Park in Toronto. So it's at Parliament in Dundas, just east, and it's going to be a really great show. Oh, I we, can't wait to yeah, see it. Yeah, it's got good. We have we've got a really great cast and got a really great you know creative team, and, and it's my first time directing. Wonderful. So I was just like. So if a listener in another part of the world, Mm. let's say in South America, in Africa, in Europe, wants to produce an indigenous North American or indigenous Canadian play, Mm -hmm. for lack of of a better term, once again, I don't know how I define indigenous people from our continent. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that. Um, Could they contact Native Earth and get the process going saying, I want to do Keith Barker's play. I just heard it on this podcast and I want to produce it in a small town in Spain. Yeah. You could you contact us. There's a contest, contact us button on the website. Keith at nativeearth.ca is my, my email at Native Earth as artistic director. Send him an email saying you l- listened to this episode and you enjoyed his conversation. Yeah. Or you, if you want to just read the play, you can look up 
Playwrights Canada Press who, who published it. Sure. You can buy it there. You can get an e-copy or get a hard copy Fantastic. and read it first and get an idea of if you like the play. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're talking with a couple uh, different companies about possibly doing a live, like, uh, airing of it oh, online. So, so one could watch it on Twitch or on some theatrical experience, yeah. whether it be on your computer, on your television, or in a larger capacity. Yeah, if we can get the rights, if we can figure that all out and, like, work with actor equity and, and all that stuff, if that's possible, it may we may... We may do that. If there's any assistance that I can lend, <laughs> I'm here for you. That's okay. all I'm going to say. Keith Barker, thank you so much for being on this episode. I really appreciate your time, your knowledge, and just having a good conversation with you. Yeah, me too. Thanks. Uh, as always, The Insomnia Project is produced by Drumcast Productions, and we hope you were able to listen and possibly sleep. <laughs> <laughs>